Morgan, who was also taken for the coach because of his natty dress. It is interesting to note that six members of that team represented the United States in the Olympics were on a United States national team. From this team evolved a succession of players such as Ralph Engelstead, who learned his lessons well in school and went on to financial glory with a man of the tennis shoes now holed up in England, one Howard Hughes. The University of North Dakota hockey team, a charter member of the premier college hockey conference of the country, has finished in the top four positions for 13 out of the 20 years of the WCHA and have never finished in last place. They have appeared in six NCAA championships and were NCAA national champions in 59 and 63. Both championships were won in the East, Troy, New York, and Boston. They were runner-up once and beat the great Cornell goalie Ken Dryden now of the Montreal Canadiens. Fifteen University of North Dakota hockey players have won 22 All-American First Team awards, named by the American Hockey Coaches Association, the latest being Alan Hanksleben, who won the award as a freshman almost an unprecedented situation. Ten players are represented in the United States on Olympic and U.S. national teams, with Billy Reichert being named captain of the 64 team. Three former Sioux players are now playing in the National Hockey League, one in the World Hockey Association, Dennis Hextall with the Minnesota North Stars, John Marks with the Chicago Blackhawks, Dave Hudson with the New York Islanders, and lefty Mike Kern with the St. Paul Saints. Four former Sioux players have gone on to become college coaches. Bill Selman, former Sioux coach and now coach of the St. Louis Billikens. Jerry Walford, coach of Ohio State. Bob Johnson, coach of the University of Wisconsin. Bob Peters, former Sioux coach and now at Bemidji State. The University of North Dakota in all-time competition with the 10 other members of the Western Collegiate Hockey Association hold winning records over every other team except the University of Wisconsin and in Notre Dame, which they are tied. Notre Dame, incidentally, played the first game in a conference game in the history of their school at the Old Barn last year, which was quite a place in history for Notre Dame. Who will ever forget the solo dashes of Buzz Johnson, bedecked with a white towel wrapped around his neck, and his colorful brother Prince, now deceased, who possessed that rare element called charisma? Jolting Joe Silovich featuring, of course, the Mariucci skates and missing the train connection at Minneapolis to Colorado Springs. Donnie Ross, two-time All-American and U.S. Olympic star, still the highest scoring defenseman at the University of North Dakota. Coach Barry Thornycrafts, in again, out again, and finally out again, jockeying with the Department of Immigration. Amo Bassoni being hung in effigy at the old barn. Pop Noise, running the greatest non-Chinese laundry in the country in the depths of the old rink. The Sioux's greatest fan, George Smith, speaking ex cathedra at all time on college hockey. The Oral Roberts School of Coaching is applied by Bob May. The pacing of the in the box by Coach Bill Selman with arms folded, looking like a mighty Joe Young. Coach Bob Peters, disc jockeying a between period pep talk to the strains of a three dog night record. And Coach Rube Bjorkman holding forth during the game like a pope with a pen in hand. The colorful Fido Perper, the former coach who furnished the impetus for hockey in Grand Forks in the North Dakota State. Billy Steenson being named an All-American three years in a row. The four consecutive shutouts of goalie Spike Schultz until he fell in love. Reg Morelli's winning goal in the Sioux's first NCAA championship in Troy, New York. The most valuable player award by Al McLean in the Sioux's second NCAA championship in Boston. George Cheagle scoring three goals in one minute and 15 seconds and making Sports Illustrated. Dave Cardio also making Sports Illustrated, scoring four goals and defeating Denver 4-1. President Starcher taking a pratfall on the ice in the Winter Carnival ceremonies. <laughs> one of the greatest moves since Yvonne Cornway. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> the first hockey school held in the United States at the old Winter Sports Building by now General Manager Emil Francis of the New York Rangers, Gordy Howe playing an exhibition in the old barn, the ever-present face and always helping hand of one Al Perper. Kenny Johansson's keeping the puck by himself for an interminable time against the Crimson of Harvard. The two referees, Jack McKee and Pete Allman. The loaded trains to Minneapolis. <laughs> the lineups for the old Minnesota series. 
These are but a small number of the many incidents that were part of the history of the University of North Dakota. The amazing thing to this whole story is the university has reached this position in college hockey and playing in one of the worst hockey rinks in the country with practices and games held in below zero weather. Now the University of North Dakota is playing in certainly the top college rink in the country. It's been uh, by knowledgeable hockey people, and I was just talking to one of the National Hockey League scouts in town, and he said, absolutely the finest rink in the country. It's been built, and it was built, not by the state of North Dakota, but it was built by UND students, faculty, alumni, and friends of the university. We are here this day for the dedication of this magnificent new facility with the knowledge that the University of North Dakota will climb to even greater heights, if that's possible. Now I'd like to call on Len Marty to introduce some of the people in the audience. Len? <laughs> Opening remarks for the afternoon provided by Bob Buston. Thank you, Bob. That was a glowing story of UND hockey. This is Bob Buston, in case you don't know him. He's our MC today. Bob was uh, one of our hockey managers, and he's a hockey nut if there ever was one. But not anyhow. He's almost as much as a hockey nut as my wife. Uh, I don't sit near her very often because she's so loud, but uh, she is a hockey bug, and so I have to introduce her. Mrs. Marty, would you stand? <coughs> And we have with us Mrs. Jamie Jamison. I think it was John, but you know, all we ever call him was Jamie. And uh, I'm not sure what his first name was. Would you stand, Mrs. Jamison? <laughs> and then Margaret Jarrett, Glenn, Glenn Jarrett. I worked with Glenn for 12 years. Uh, Margaret Jarrett. <laughs> and uh, Mrs. Rube Bjorkman, our coach's wife. If Rube wins, they have steak after the game. If he loses, they, they have nothing. They go all without any food. Uh, Mrs. Al Perper, um, Al is up in front here. And uh, Vi. Vi uh, almost ought to be ready for an award, too. She's been running our concessions now for so many years that I've forgotten uh, how many. We have some other people scattered around. We tried to get them all to the reserve table, but uh, they had groups that they were with, so we'll, uh, we'll try to find them. Close by, we have uh, Mrs. Art Koth. He was referred to in the history. Mrs. Koth. <laughs> Mrs. Uh, Prince Johnson and her son, their son, they're over here someplace. Would you stand, please? We have a few people at the head table, and their wives are scattered about. Mrs. Cal Marvin, where are you, Mrs. Marvin? Way over there. Uh, Mrs. Lloyd Stone, with her family someplace. Where are you, Grace? Um, uh, we have the chairman, or the faculty representative uh, on our athletic board, Mr. R.D. Copenhaver, is here someplace? Cope. I see uh, one of our vice presidents out here, vice president for operation, Lauren Swanson. Lauren. <laughs> we had uh, two lettermen who were co-chairmen for really arranging this whole timers get together, John Noah and Cal Marvin. Cal is up here. Uh, John and Mrs. Noah are out in the audience and they'll be on duty tonight. Would you stand, John and Mrs. Noah? <laughs> You know, when you start introducing a lot of people, you might miss some. I should really introduce everybody, but maybe Bob will do that a little later on, all the old-time players. I have one other individual at the head table here, <coughs> uh, two other individuals, and I would like to introduce them. Mrs. Tom Clifford, wife of our president. <laughs> and now the other gentleman up here, 
He needs no introduction to the hockey players he was referred to in this history. Uh, he uh, has just popped to all of us, and it's an extreme pleasure to have Pop with us today and to visit with the old timers. Pop. We're glad you could be with us. He's getting spryer every day, I think. You know, a while back, he wasn't moving around like he is now, but uh, he does a great job for us and did for many, many years, and we really miss him around here. Bob, I think that uh, pretty well covers all of our introductions. Okay, I'd like to call on President Thomas Clifford for a few comments. Thank you very much, Bob, and everyone. Uh, this is a weekend that we've been looking forward to for quite a long time, and I suppose everyone's just about as thrilled as I am. But in addition to dedicating this marvelous facility today, I think the real highlight of the weekend for me is to see all of the players coming back and to visit with them. I've known quite a few of them through the years, and it's a real pleasure to see you all here, and I'm just so happy you could come back to the campus. I got to know some of them pretty well, of course, uh, through the years, and this team in 1947 was the one that I probably knew the best. They had as their house mother an uh, ex-Marine by the name of Cal Marvin, <laughs> and uh, I got to know them that same way, too, because President West found out I'd been in the Marine Corps, and uh, he appointed me Dean of Men and asked me to conduct some sensitivity training for them, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we did that. <laughs> you know, in those old days, why... We had a little rule at the university that if you missed a class, if so many classes you owed uh, so many course credits, you know, I think it was something like you had eight cuts, you got three credits lost. And they had a great team record. <laughs> I think they were the only group that ever went, uh, as 15 of them went to class for the whole semester and owed the university 32 credits. <laughs> I always remember Guinea Christian, you know, he was a, he was a tremendous skater. And uh, he was just all grace on the ice. I mean, the most graceful man I've ever seen in skating, really, except maybe Reg Morelli. <laughs> and uh, I got a call from the ROTC one day, and they said, you know, we'd like to get Christian out of here. They said, uh, he can't march. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, impossible. He, you know, you got to march. So I went over there, and, and they had me sit up in the, in the uh, balcony, and they marched Guinea's platoon by. And you know, if you ever watch the file of rifles go by, you know, and they're going the proper cadence, why, it's all even. Well, there were seven of them were even, but Guinea wasn't, you know. <laughs> he managed to come up all the way with a, a little different step. But uh, he did well on the ice. Well, I could go on and, and talk about a lot of the people that way because we've had a lot of great teams and a lot of great athletes here. Uh, I think that one of the most interesting episodes, of course, in our entire hockey career was when Fido Perper was the coach. And Fido and I had a lot of good times together. Uh, we, uh, Margaret, you'll be interested to know that some of our greatest challenges, I think, were to come back and explain our expense accounts to Red Jarrett. <laughs> that, was, that wasn't easy. Uh, we, uh, especially trying to work in Coors beer as a, as a meal. <laughs> that was always a little tough. <laughs> But we had a lot of fun, and, and he gave us some of the most exciting teams we've ever had. And Fido, it was so good, it's so good to see you here today, be with us. I saw your old friend John Mariucci there last night, and he said he's going to give you a few choice comments today. But to all of you, it's so nice to have you back. We are looking forward to tonight to the ball game, of course, and more particularly to the dedication. Uh, it's, just a, it's just a tremendous facility. And we owe so much to so many because of for it. As I said, we waited an awful long time to get this put together. And there are some people we probably won't get a chance to expressly honor tonight. But there are people that had a lot to do with getting this arena put together. And I just want to mention them. Maybe Len would later on. But just in case, I just want to pay particular tribute to John O'Keefe, who is a, right over here. John is the guy that put the drive together downtown and 
Earl Strinan, the alumni worked with him, and Len Marty and Tom Flanders and Lloyd Stone, but uh, John had the burden of putting the drive together and organizing it, and he just did a, a marvelous job, and we're all so appreciative of it, and I'm sure, John, you got from the applause how good everybody feels about it. And then, you know, this has been a series of continued crises from the time of the first planning of the auditorium when we got the first $2,500 from Lloyd to conduct the survey. But uh, one of the things that most of you won't, remember, won't know, but it was very important, uh, last July, I guess, we're sweating out the seats. And we got this thing, if you ever heard on the, about getting a building on the installment plan, this is one. Uh, we'd get, first we got the shell, and then we got a roof, and then we got the ice, and then we got the plastic sideboards and all of this thing. But we came down to the point where we didn't have the seats. And George Smith came in about that time, who's been a, a very great hockey fan and supporter. And we uh, sat down in the Westward Hole one morning, and he said, you know, we've got to get those seats. And uh, he said, I'll get you a good bid if you get the money. And we both came through. But George, we do appreciate that because he saved us just a tremendous sum of money. And when you look there tonight and see those green and white seats, those very comfortable benches, uh, he's had a lot to do with that. And George, I want to pay tribute to you because that was just fine. <laughs> so that's just about been the story on it. It's a combined effort of a lot of people and it's culminated in a lot of good. So we're looking forward to tonight and thank you all for being here. Our next speaker is President Emeritus George Starcher, who really should have written that book instead of Nixon, My Seven Crises, when it was involved in taking over this rank. President Starcher. Ladies and gentlemen, I, if I were to address all of the dignitaries here, I'd spend all my time and more just reading and just reciting names. Needless to say, I'm delighted that your President Clifford uh, made it necessary that I be here by just inviting me, and uh, uh, I wouldn't have missed it for anything. When I came in 1954 to the University of North Dakota, I didn't even know you played hockey with a flat thing. I thought it was something you do with a ball, but I found out. But I was told, I think it was Red Jarrett and some others showed me around uh, along with the deans and other people, uh, taking me all around every place except where that snowdrift was formed. And I was told uh, that every, all the troubles are over in hockey because we just got artificial ice the previous year. You remember, 1953. And so uh, we'd have no problems in hockey from that point on. Well, I was glad of that because obviously Old Main was falling down. We had to get an Old Main built and some other things. It would be nice to have one part of the university with nothing to worry about. I remember it wasn't very long, though, until somebody began to worry about the fact that the pucks flew up over the boards rather easily and thought we ought to have some kind of protectors, and glass was called for. Well, glass would cost more. Well, it had been about as easy to get glass around there as it was to get the entire hockey rink this time. So we finally compromised on chicken wire, <laughs> and... Uh, Everybody began to complain about the height of that, but after a little blood showed when a couple of pucks went over the wire, I remember we didn't hear any more about that. And I do remember the uh, time I fell for the Queen at the KK Carnival, you remember? That's one of the memories that'll be indelibly in my mind. I'll never, <laughs> I'll never forget. Kind of you all not to do the obvious, too. You, you were very quiet for a while. But I have a most embarrassing moment that way that I can tell people. I often am asked about my experience as a president. I remember in one uh, circle, someone spoke up and said, tell us now what's your most embarrassing moment. Well, I had one on tap. There wasn't very much talk of new building, really, with the artificial ice, wasn't much talk about, maybe. But we all huddled together, you know, along those seats lined up in rows. I remember one time I sat next to a very prominent and well-known and possibly here hockey fan and his wife. And they shared their thermos uh, of coffee with me, and my wife and I thought that was the best coffee we ever tasted. <laughs> 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 
And I want them to know we appreciate it. Went around the next day to try to get the brand name of the stuff. <laughs> we used to get warm, I remember. It seemed to me more from bouncing around against each other, somewhat on the principle of the microwave oven, than we did from the little heat that came out in the warming rooms or from the uh, concessions that was available mostly to those on the periphery of the crowd. But uh, we weren't so cold as I recall. But sitting there on those uh, benches tight together reminded me of the uh, students who used to sit in the old Yale fence after dinner at night on into the evening chat and then break up. The historian of Yale expressed that phenomenon this way. He said, night after night it, meaning the old fence, Nine after night, it receives innumerable rivulets of common leisure. Thigh to thigh sits scholar, athlete, and bohemian in a guild of fellowship far better than the dusty ruts of learning. Well, I thought that kind of <laughs> reminded me of our sitting in those rows on, in the old hockey rink. There ever got to be more talk about the need for building, but then it seemed that uh, Sometimes there were more empty seats. And so there were those who said, look, you don't need a new building, really. We aren't filling the seats in the one we got. But then there were people who insisted that people would come if you had a place that was reasonably warm and comfortable where they could sit and watch the game. There were even people in Grand Forks, believe it or not, who probably unconsciously were quoting President Lyndon Johnson's last sentence to a United, State, a United Nations group in a speech when he said, what was for other generations a hope is for us a simple necessity. And that kind of got, uh, kind of caught on, I feel. At least the idea caught on. I don't think there are enough people who would take a Democrat speech and make so much of it, but <laughs> the, I, the idea that the hope is really for us critical, simple necessity, caught on. But then the question always came up, but how can we get such a ring? Well, the alumni, as alumni are prone to do sometimes, uh, went ahead and got a sketch made. They sometimes start in and do things, you know, that a little thought would uh, tell you is impossible. There was a sketch made, and estimates were made, and the estimates came out to be far above the amount of money available in the state of North Dakota. And so it seemed as though it was something to be impossible. But I'll always remember a small group, and I won't try to name them because I'd surely leave out one or two, and that wouldn't be fair, who met in the alumni office to talk this thing over finally, and either we'll kill it or we'll go ahead uh, and determine. But this small group was pretty clear pretty obvious, just simply weren't ready to let this idea die. There were even those who believed that the students would support it strongly and that the townspersons, and they also believed that perhaps the estimates could be brought down by some changes in the building. And they also believed that you could even get 5,000 people to go to a single hockey game. And so from that uh, meeting on, planning began to develop. And many, many people, as you know, have heard and will hear over and over, got involved with it. And as they got involved, it seems to me they were beginning to express a thought that has been expressed and quoted many times of Daniel Burnham, the city planner, who said, uh, make no little plans. Little plans, he said, have no magic with which to sear men's blood and little plans probably would not be realized anyway. Make big plans, aim high. Our sons and their sons will do things that would stagger us. Remember when you create something that captures the imagination, you capture life, reason, everything. Well again, whether that was ever quoted exactly in those words, the spirit I think was evident. And then there was the response of the community. People gave to create a kind of memorial, or at least themselves a part of a memorial, that would be far better than a piece of stone on some public square somehow. Somehow people just knew 
A starless sky reveals no gleam. Life is dismal without a dream. And one said, one individual said, in less lofty language, in, God, in God's closing crap game, I want to be where the action is, and he gave. Partly, I think, to walk with eternity for having helped build a university. For one never knows where or how long his influence carries on through a university, unchanged, undiminished, indestructible. So I'd like to add my word of thanks to all of you. First of all, I think of the athletes for making all of it a necessity, and all of those who knew the university and its needs and who responded with their, respor with their support. I think that you have said clearly that good hockey will continue at the university. You planted a great tree whose shade you can al cannot always enjoy, but others can. And you make me feel very humble and grateful for the chance to be a part of a sharing, sacrificing group that together has built a, here a monument to ideals that you cherish and without which the university could, could be, without which the university could be great, I'm sure, but it would be a lesser place and it surely will be from now on. I'd like to conclude by paraphrasing Maxwell Anderson, saying that the old winter, spilt, uh, winter sports building is retired now, proud to have been here during all of those years when UND needed it so badly, surrounded by memories of great moments of victory and some equally great depths of disappointment. But here, the tradition carries on bigger, better, Yet, just as personal as each puck and brick placed in those walls personally by each one of you. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Listening to the past president of the University of North Dakota, George Starcher. Video 1590, KRAD, East Grand Forks, well, Minnesota. Mr. Starcher, the alumni president couldn't be here today. He had a uh, daughter, I believe, that had a broken arm in Lake Forest, and he had to go back. But we've got in his place and on our stage the world's greatest alumni director, and my good friend, J. Lloyd Stone. Thank you, Bob. I trained Bob, you see, at the university. He worked for me for two or three years when he was at the university. He was a very faithful worker. He doesn't know it, but I know that about half the time he put in for me, he was over coaching the hockey team over in the Winter Sports Building. But we were glad to pay him for that. I know, too, he was one of the greatest, is one of the greatest hockey enthusiasts we've ever had at the university. It isn't his fault that we didn't have this ice arena, this new arena, 15, 20 years ago. He pushed us hard enough. Uh, Mary Christofferson didn't break her arm. She's 12 years old, and she hopes to play on the Sioux hockey team someday, so she was out practicing hockey, and she broke her leg. And so Wes had to go back to Lake Forest to help look after his daughter. Uh, Jack Stewart would like to have been here today. Many of you know Jack Stewart, one of our most loyal alums. He's the fellow probably most responsible for the building of the university stadium. But he had been very ill for two or three months, and he's only home from the hospital now. And I talked to him on the phone the other day and told him about this dedication. I said, what would you like to have said here at this dedication. You know, he was the fellow who helped spearhead this thing. He encouraged us to go ahead, even when the money wasn't available. Well, he said, you might tell him that we are really making progress. He said, when I was in school, I remember we played hockey in the vacant lot across from the Sigma Chi house, uh, where the student union is now located. And he said, I remember what a great day it was when we got boards around the arena, that outdoor arena. And he said, you might tell him about that. And even before that, he said, they used to play hockey out in the Cooley. The boys from Budge Hall would play the girls from Davis Hall. And he said, they had some great <laughs> hockey games there. And then, of course, we remember the day when we had the winter sports building. And that year when they repaired the roof so it wouldn't leak. And then the artificial ice. And I remember Bob Buston helped push for that. Well, we do appreciate 
the enthusiasm that Jack Stewart has shown toward the university all of these years, and I think we should give Jack Stewart a hand for the $90,000 he contributed to help make this project possible, the largest donor. <laughs> I'll pass this on to Jack Stewart when I see him in the not too distant future. I think too we should give a big hand to Mark Foss because Mark Foss started this thing. He drew the plans for it all on faith. Thank heavens, Mark. I hope you've been paid a little bit for your efforts. It's a great plan and a great arena. I think we should give a hand to Mark Foss. And it's Wonderful to have recognized John O'Keefe and Earl Strindman representing the alumni office and the legislature because the legislature had a lot to do this with this, you know. We had to pass a revenue bond law and what, without the help of our legislators, this arena could not have been possible. So I think we should give a hand to Earl and John and the legislators. And in conclusion, I want to say that we had a, oh, about 2,000 contributors. Contributions of $5, $10, $1,000, and up to $90,000, which was wonderful. One group gave a large percentage wise, and that was the group of hockey players. I think about 50% of our former hockey players were contributors to this fund. And so to you hockey players, thank you for your loyalty. And we still have a few things we want to finish in the arena. And if you're so inclined, remember, the, remember us later. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Len Marty has also been a bulwark behind this drive. will now come to the podium and hold forth. Thank you, Bob. I guess the easiest thing for me to do is to echo the thanks expressed by President Clifford, uh, President Starcher. You know, I have to keep calling him President. I can't change that. Uh, I've worked for him too long, so it doesn't come out past President or Emeritus or anything else. It comes out President Starcher, no matter how I try to change it. And Lloyd Stone, I'd have to echo their thanks because if I started to thank people who helped me the last two or three years, I just, uh, you'd be here all afternoon, so I'm going to say thank you to everyone and echo their thoughts. Gentlemen uh, and ladies, we're begging and borrowing and stealing every day to finish that building. Uh, it's been great, the response of people, and we've had a lot of fun trying to finish up. Lawrence Swanson and his Plant Services Division has helped us out and they take a little from here and a little from there and do work for us and gradually we're finishing the building. Everyone who gave $120 or more will have his name or whatever names or whatever message they want put on a puck and on a puck wall. Now we had hoped to have these up by this time. We have the pucks printed. We have some 750, I believe, here. It's a black puck, a regular puck, and it's printed in gold letters we have a maximum number of letters, and uh, the people indicated what messages they wanted put on. And uh, these will be fastened to a white background board and put up on the walls on either side of the, uh, press, uh, the ticket boxes. And we just couldn't get them up. The, so they will be up sometime during this year, and when you come back, look for your name. They'll be arranged alphabetically, and uh, I'm sure you'll get a kick out of seeing them. Those who gave $1,000 or more will be put in a separate wall. It'll just be uh, marked major donors, 1,000 and over. And on their puck, there are a couple of stars, which sort of separate them from the others. Uh, the $120 ones and up were the $5 ones. They were all very important, but uh, we didn't get a lot of big ones. So these will be up. If you're interested, like Lloyd said, and your name isn't going to be on a puck, why, let me know and it can get on there very easily. Uh, we can have some more printed. <coughs> Thank you for coming back. It's been a, a real pleasure for me to visit with you. Some of you I haven't met as yet. Uh, I see you sitting out here, but we didn't have a chance to visit. I'm sure we will um, before you leave. I want to comment on 
a couple of other gifts beside Jack Stewart's. We had some large ones from Grand Forks, businesses, banks, etc. But we had two others that are, are quite interesting, and I'm sure you'll appreciate hearing about them. Doug Tegmeyer was a, a radio announcer here, a sports announce, sportscaster of the year in Grand Forks or in North Dakota for four or five years. Doug died, and money was sent in for a memorial, and uh, Mrs. Tegmeyer has designated this money for uh, equipping one of the press boxes, and there will be a plaque put up there for that purpose. Also, uh, Dr. Ralph Lee, as you heard in the history, uh, was our team physician for many years. Jim is now the team physician, and uh, Jim's been with us quite a long time. And the Lee family, uh, Jim and his two brothers, Jack and Dick, uh, Jack was one of my gymnasts, by the way. I guess it's John, but I always think of him as Jack. And uh, his mother, Mrs. Ralph Lee, have decided to, have, to uh, make it possible for us to have the best athletic training room in the United States for hockey purposes, and we have. They made an excellent contribution to equip this room, and if you go over and look at that building later on, some of you may want to tour it this afternoon, and we'll make that possible right after you leave here. Uh, go down and look at the training room. It's, it's worth seeing. <laughs> the rest of my comments are in the form of announcements. Those lettermen who reserved tickets ahead of time, and I hope you all did because we're in bad shape on tickets. If you haven't picked them up, I have them here. A number of you have not picked them up. We have only 82 seats for each game that have not been sold on a season reserve basis or are not allocated to students. Now last night you may have seen some empty seats. Everything on this side was sold. All those were sold. There wasn't an available seat. The ones on the other side belong to students. We promised them 3,000 seats for the $800,000 they put into this and we stuck to our promise. They have not quite filled any game and now we're negotiating with them uh, trying to develop a system whereby we'll know ahead of time if they aren't going to use the 3,000 so we can sell these because we have an obligation to the public too and uh, we feel they should have an opportunity to buy these uh, before game time on Friday. So we will work that out. But if you see a few seats empty, remember they've been sold. Uh, it's, it's really tough. I shouldn't have sold that many, but uh, it's nice to have that kind of a problem, to have more demand than you have seats, I guess. So uh, if you did not pick up your tickets, uh, come and see me, and uh, we'll try to take care of you. I hope you did reserve them ahead of time. If there's anyone else here who does not have tickets, I, I really can't tell you what to do right now. You might talk to me, and uh, I might be able to help you later on. All the lettermen, I guess Bob will mention this too, don't forget to stay. We want to get a picture. We've got a photographer here. Also, there's a smoker tonight. Everyone is welcome out at the Westward Ho. Is that right, Bob? That's right. And you'll have that too, I suppose. And Charleston Room, and uh, come on out. Uh, the people who are on the dedication program tonight, will you be sure and stay right after this meeting? We should get together for a few minutes, probably over here on this round table, and maybe we'll go out in the lounge and talk about tonight. Thank you again for coming, and thank you for the wonderful support we've received for a hockey program ever since 1947. I came in 46 before the big time, and it's been a real thrill to grow up with hockey. <laughs> UND Athletic Director, L.R. Marty. Our next guest was known as the Mask Marvel in Roseville, Minnesota. He played in the Minnesota State Tournament as a seventh grader. He was a member of two United States Olympic teams, he was the captain of the U.S. National World Team in 1955. He's the coach of the University of North Dakota hockey team. He's also president-elect of the American College Hockey Coaches Association. Rube Bjorkman. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, in the uh, sense of levity here, uh, Lloyd, Mr. Stone, I'm uh, not surprised to hear that you have the same problems or had the same problems with Bob Buston that Channel 8 and I are having right now that he's spending about half his time coaching the hockey team. <laughs> but, uh,
Uh, it's kind of nice to be on this side of the fence because uh, I took my lickings many and many years ago from the Dan McKinnons, the Cal Marvins, the Gordy Christians, and the John Noahs. And it's really a pleasure to be uh, working with a fine bunch of people like this. Uh, in fact, it took Gordy Christian many years to come over to my side. I can remember playing in the 55 World Games and being on his line and on a breakout pass once, he was one wing and I was the other. He drilled me right behind the ear, but <laughs> we, we've gotten over those things. Uh, so it's a special pleasure to be representing the University of North Dakota and to keep everything very simple. I would like to express my appreciation and thanks for uh, all of those people who've gotten North Dakota hockey to the point it's at today. The fans, the school administrators, the coaches, and certainly all the players. Thank you. Representing the uh, Sioux Boosters is Bob Jesus McCann. Thank you, Bob. Um, uh, my remarks are very brief. I came to Grand Forks to go to law school when Billy Reichert was playing hockey, and since that time, uh, these fellows have given us a fantastic amount of entertainment, and on behalf of the Sioux Boosters Club and, I think, the spectators, uh, we really appreciate it. You've given us a heck of a bunch of entertainment. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is probably the top entrepreneur in the Amateur Hockey Association circles in the United States. He has been for a long time. In the, early, in the 50s, he brought and coached a United States national team to Moscow, Cal Marvin. Thanks, Bob. You could have said a lot of other nice things about me. <laughs> Don't be looking at your watch. You don't have to worry. We'll get out of here. He could have mentioned the fact that the wife and I have 12 wonderful children back home. That's probably my greatest claim to fame. I appreciate uh, Father Tim started things out quite well today up here. Uh, too bad he doesn't fish as well as he preaches. And I've been with John Noah so long that I'm looking for the day when a function like this takes place that one of us Lutherans can get up here and do that. <laughs> <clears throat> it's always got to be a left winger, you know. <laughs> well, we've got to get out, Father Tim. I never know what to say with him. I don't know if he just got married. They're all getting married. <laughs> Back when they tell a story on me when I went to school, I couldn't spell motel, and now I own one. <laughs> I knew uh, Tom Clifford years ago, but evidently with his progress, he could spell university because now I own one. I met Mrs. Jared on the way in tonight, and I said if it wasn't for her husband, a lot of us wouldn't be here tonight. And this is very true because I'll never forget that day we walked in and talked to Red about the possibility of bringing some fellas in here to play hockey. We were all playing around the old States Dominion League then, the boys from Crookston and Hellock and War Road and Grand Forks. And he says, I'll tell you one thing, Marvin, as he sat there smoking that cigar, and he says, I've had a lot of fellas walk in here and tell me the same thing on football, Matt. And I said, this is probably true, but I says, I think there's a chance there that we can deliver. So we got together and the fellas came over and ended up with quite a club and, and he kept his promise by getting the schedule and I think I think he got that hockey team for a few shoelaces and some of Bob Pace's pink socks in those days. <laughs> we had a lot of good times together and those good times were uh, revolved around fellas like Ben Gustus in out here. He used to take a lot of pride in our hockey club. A lot of us weren't the brightest fellas. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I should back that up a little bit. Before the war, I was doing accounting college for a short stay. <laughs> I went there because my brother was an outstanding basketball and football player for him and a very good student, so they took another Marvin in a few years later, and that was me in the middle of the year. The president called me in. He said, Mr. Marvin, you're not doing so well, are you? And I said, no, there seems to be a few problems, and Spanish and some of that. And well, he says, you know, we've got a war effort going on. And I said, yes, I'm quite aware of it. He says, have you ever thought of joining up? <laughs> I went home for Christmas and joined the Marine Corps, and that's how I met Tom Clifford. But getting back to Ben Gustafson, he used to take a lot of pride in some of the exams and that we wrote in chemistry, and we had to get a, that course in. And he would say, as a little motivation to the other students, he'd say, look at the fine paper that Ted Wilson and Dan McKinnon and people like this wrote. They spent the weekend in Michigan playing hockey, and they come back and write a paper like this. But he didn't go down to Mr. Christian, Mr. Dickinson, Mr. Marvin, which we always appreciated. The night that we played out in Michigan, I'll never forget that, and I'll never, oh, never be able to figure out how a guy like John Noe ever made All-American. There isn't anybody on our team that can ever figure that one out yet. <laughs> well, that's the power of the press, and somebody has to suffer. <laughs> but prior to that night on that win out there, it was quite an achievement because the newspapers out there the next day said they didn't know what side the Mississippi, the state of North Dakota, was on until last night. That's the way they wrote it up anyway. I remember the memories we had. We used to come over here afterwards when we played, and Vi would be working in the concession there, you know, and she says, Cal, have a Coke. I says, don't do that. Marty might see you. <laughs> we always ran a tight ship, you know, and evidently he's still doing the same job. But you know, as Probably one of the greatest things in sports or in life is things like today and the people we meet and the places we go and hockey people are a strange group. Everybody tells you that. They're quite a loyal bunch. And two, uh, two bad partners I could never figure out is a guy like Reg Morelli and the president of the university. I'll never put that one together. <laughs> Red, uh, uh, Reg, I told you that this morning. He was short on tickets. He's got 14 now, Marty. If you're short, why don't you see him? <laughs> well, we had a lot of good times over here. Like I say, some of us didn't finish. We found a future in selling minnows and raising kids. Thanks a lot for coming. <laughs> God, Cal sounds more like Will Rogers every day. <laughs> I'd like to introduce my honored guest today, Ruth Paulson. <clears throat> and now we're going to call for a award to a gentleman who I believe is the only slave that's never been emancipated, Al Perper. I call on Lloyd Richmond. Lloyd Richmond of uh, a Richmond architect firm here in Grand Forks, and a special award for Al Perper. As president of the UND Alumni Letterman's Club, this is the second time I've been called on to, to make this award, and it, it gives me a lot of pleasure. Uh, athletes by the hundred, coaches, administrators by the dozen come and go. But for 37 years, Albert, better known as Al Perper, has been a constant man of action on the UND athletic scene. Al easily ranks as the oldest in point of service on the present athletic staff. He joined the department in August 1936 under the late 
CA Jack West, then athletic director and head football coach. On the university organization table, Al is called an assistant foreman of the department. That title no way can adequately describe this gentleman's longtime devotion, enthusiasm, and pride in the work he has done for UND athletics and athletes in nearly four decades. That may seem like a long time to many of you, but Al, who is now 62 years young, still has very youthful ideas. Since his first day under Jack West, Al has done hundreds of jobs and done all of them with one thought in mind. Nothing is ever too good for UND athletes. He's been an equipment manager. He is widely known as one of the best ice makers in the country. He's a fine groundskeeper. The turf at Memorial Stadium has been under his care alone for all these years. He can make the best running track surface uh, that you'll ever want to see. He can manicure a baseball field or an intramural athletic uh, diamond better than anyone. And he's a good mechanic, horticulturist, and what he's forgotten about janitorial work isn't worth knowing. Al is a soft-spoken man. He's never been known to lose his temper and is always willing to help those with problems. While Al has been connected with all sports at uh, UND, it is probably correct to, to say that hockey is his first love. Al has been in hockey since he learned to skate as a youngster. He played on many local amateur teams and has also coached. He comes from a hockey family. Two of his brothers, Cliff and Ken, have earned national hockey reputations. Cliff, known to everyone as Fido, was the first North Dakotan to play in the National Hockey League. And following his big time career, he coached Sioux teams for seven seasons. Ken, now a teacher in Rapid City, played with the U.S. Olympic team. His older brother, Ray, also a amateur standout uh, player and now lives in Grand Forks, as does Cliff. The four Purple boys and three sisters are the children of Mr. and Mrs. Adolph Purple, Purper, who still live at 1301 First Avenue North. Al was married in 1934 to Bi Pomplin of this city. Bi has been the very efficient manager of our athletic food concession for many years. We salute Al Perper. Ceremonies. The, the Letterman's Club Honorary Award it presented to Al Perper by the University of North Dakota Alumni Letterman's Club. Congratulations, Al. Thank you. And, uh, and, uh, and as a further uh, token of our esteem, we've got a gift certificate that we would like to give to you. Thanks. Okay, thanks again. <laughs> Thank you. Bob, two presidents, many hockey players, many university professors. I want to say thanks to all of them, the people that helped me, which are many. A lot of them aren't here today, but I still want to say I've always loved hockey, all the other sports. I worked, and I always want to say when I do a job, I want to do it to the best. There are a lot of times I've talked to athletes and I say, you go out there and you do your best. This is what counts. I'm a poor loser. I want to win. And I work every year for the winning team. Now I got a new rank over there. I don't know how I'm going to win because my time is running out, but I'm still going to stick a little while yet. And thanks to everybody for everything you've done. I think one of the great stories about Al Perber that exemplifies what he's done at the University of North Dakota, 
a, the Grand Forks Amherst were playing a Canadian team, so they came in and they went to the ticket office and there was Al. They said, uh, okay, how do we get in? He said, just go in that door down the basement. And they said, okay, now, who do we give to give our skates sharpened? He said, well, I'll do that later. He went down there and uh, their manager came up and he said, where do we get our towels? You get it from Al Perper. They go out on the ice and Al Perper's making ice. Comes the referee and Al Perper's reffing. <laughs> We've got a gentleman here today who's coached the University of North Dakota for seven years. He made history in hockey for the for University of North Dakota and as a hockey player, Cliff Fido Perper. About three years ago, he was honored by the city of St. Louis, along with Stan Musial and Joe Garagiola is the three most popular players to ever play in that city. Cliff Fight Up Purple, would you stand up? <laughs> now what we'd like to do uh, fast, we'd like to go to each table and all the UND hockey players past, we'd like to have you get up, say where you are now and what you're doing. We'll start with this table over here. I'm afraid right about now we haven't got the entire room mic, so we might find ourselves in a little bit of trouble. Right now our wow. time is 25 before the hour of 3, Radio 1590 KRAD in East Grand Forks, Minnesota. You're listening to the activities around the dedication luncheon here at the University of North Dakota. And if I can grab Jack off in the corner here, maybe we can uh, chat for just a couple of moments. Reg, I understand you're making introductions of all the Sue Letterman that are on hand. It's a, uh, definitely, this has been uh, quite an afternoon affair. Well, this is one of the greatest, I think. Uh, what a great turnout this afternoon, too, Dwayne, and uh, a great effort by a lot of people involved with Calmar, and especially in John Noah, I think, put this together for these Letterman that they're honoring right now. They're standing up, but uh, hockey fans, I think this is probably the highlight of many people in this room today. A lot of hard work went into it, and, uh, and they finally uh, reaped the harvest. Well, of course, tonight now at 7.35, 7.40, they'll have the dedication ceremony on the ice at the new arena, and we're hoping all the hockey fans will get out there early tonight so that they're there for the dedication. Well, I'm sure they will. Uh, the place, I guess, has been sold out, Dwayne, but we at KID will be carrying uh, that uh, live right from the rink, I'm sure. Right. We'll have the dedication on the air, so if you are coming out late, you can listen to it on your way out. And there are a lot of lettermen that they're getting around to. I'll tell you, Cal Marvin, uh, I, I just hearing him today, I, I think I know who I'm going to go after as our state high school hockey tournament uh, speaker. Well, he's a great one. I know that uh, he's been active in so many years. Uh, he's got a large family of 12, I guess himself, a lot of hockey players still coming. <laughs> but, you know, Duane, he's been... Uh, a uh, tremendous asset to this whole uh, area as far as ice hockey goes. He's kept with it. He's still active in the United States Amateur Hockey Association. And uh, the kids up there, I guess, in the early days of uh, 30 below weather standing outside, and we played a lot of hockey up in World Road Outdoors before, the, before these arenas became into realities. And of course, uh, World Road still has the world famous square corners, don't they? Well, I guess if they're uh, just new right now, I don't think they've got artificial they finally, ice. They finally mm -hmm. opened her up, yeah. huh? Yeah, I think that they got there going. But that was a community effort, too. You know, the boys got together up there, and they said, we're just going to put this rink up. And that's what was it? It's uh, Mara, it's uh, World Road Memorial Rink. It was after the war, and it was all... Uh, built of this uh, lumber right around their native lumber from right around the area of Oregon. Well, uh, I know the Christian boys are down. Of course, uh, they have the Christian Brothers uh, Hockey Stick Company up at War Road. And well, Jimmy is one of the great ones at a university, and he's very popular. That's still active in hockey up at Hibbing, Minnesota. I think he coached the Purple Kids not long ago, uh, a couple, three years ago, but he's still active. Uh, Pat Finnegan is uh, coaching. He was going to come into town, but uh, he... Uh, <laughs> is tied up with a coaching job up in Masabi Range now, as some of the old hockey fans would know that uh, he's coming into Crooks and playing and over to uh, Northland Junior College in Sioux River sometime this month, so uh, maybe some of the fans will get to see him too. And of course, a lot of the Sioux Lettermen are in the Twin Cities area coaching, and uh, they were unable to get back for the weekend. 
Yes, I know that they're introducing so many of these now. Uh, of course, uh, Dwayne, this is the uh, kids in my uh, reign, too, in the 1947 area, that uh, these kids all came from up in northern Minnesota that played here. I think they were, I don't think, they, they were all Americans, I guess, in that 1947 game. Well, Jack, uh, you know, they always pull one of these on us. Uh, we didn't have a mic at every table in the place, so we're kind of uh, just... Uh, Swinging along here, it's been quite a gathering. She has uh, Dwayne. Uh, Bob Buston has just introduced Joe Silovich as being one of the most colorful uh, athletes in the history of the University of North Dakota. And Joe's up now saying a few words. Uh, they've introduced the athletes all over the uh, room. And uh, <laughs> Joe Silovich is challenging any of the ex Sioux athletes to a skating exhibition. He's now at uh, Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. Jim Medved, uh, just to my right, and uh, Dan McKinnon. Uh, just uh, a roster of great uh, hockey names in the University of North Dakota history, and uh, the luncheon certainly is a marvelous affair, Dwayne. Well, it was an ideal menu. Uh, roast beef, very tender. And, of course, uh, there's been a lot of trivia exchange today, but uh, a lot of warmth of the old Sioux fans getting back here and uh, truly enjoying the goings-on. Yes, it's, uh, it's, it's a grand affair. Somebody made the suggestion, uh, Duane, that uh, it would be a very nice idea if we could have um, something similar to the football homecoming, sort of a hockey get-together of this kind every year. And I think it, uh, if this affair is any example of it, it certainly is a marvelous idea. Bob Dorsher, who is a prominent Chicago businessman. Cliff Pyder Perper being introduced. Uh, there's John Noah, one of North Dakota's All-Americans. Um, here's uh, Bob, Dr. Bob Crumholes, who gave us many thrills out on the uh, ice for the University of North Dakota. Bob Monroe with the FBI in Washington, D.C., who was a student manager for the University of North Dakota hockey team way back when, and uh, a leading law enforcement man. Um, I believe he's the uh, weapons instructor for the entire uh, Bureau, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Bob Grenner, a leading businessman, building contractor in Grand Forks, being introduced across the way. And there's John Noel. Making uh, reference to his friends, the Christian Brothers, who of course have the hockey stick uh, plant in uh, Ward, uh, Minnesota. Bill Sullivan of Crookston being introduced. He's probably the most good, I guess, of any uh, university player in a single game. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe Bill is from Crookston, Minnesota. And, of course, Bill is uh, head hockey coach at Crookston Cathedral, uh, coaching the Blue Wave. And uh, having a great year, too, by the way, Dwayne. Oh, definitely, uh, very possibly. Uh, in that Minnesota State Catholic tournament, uh, Crookston Cathedral uh, is going to go a long way this year. John Noel making uh, remarks to the extent that Buzz Johnson, who with his brother Prince, uh, for outstanding University of North Dakota hockey players is unable to be here. He's in San Diego, California. Um, he had a heart attack some time ago and is recovering. And Johnny Noah spoke to him on the telephone and is conveying his regards to the group here. Uh, his brother moved from Prince Johnson, who was one of the most uh, prolific scorers in the history of the University of North Dakota Sioux, is deceased. John Gasparini introducing some high school hockey players who are being entertained by the athletic department of the University of North Dakota here at this uh, hockey luncheon in connection with the uh, dedication of the uh, Winter Sports Building Arena. They're calling on Bill Rendell now, who uh, tell um, about some of his broadcast experiences with the Fighting Sioux, Duane. And as I understand it, you, you, you're, you're going to get tapped on the shoulder next, Jack, so... <laughs> well, Duane, Bill Rendell is speaking right at the present time. Uh, 
a great turnout of fans here. The hockey uh, is really rolling this afternoon. It ought to be a great evening, too. They're going to have a smoker, I guess, after the game tonight with all the Leathermen getting together.